All right. Hello, everybody. This is James Daniel with Daily Effects. Just wanted to do a quick sound check. So if you hear my voice, please type in a Y. All right. Beautiful. Lots of Ys coming through. Looks like we're loud and clear. Good to go. Uh, just want to thank everybody very much for your time in advance. Uh, so this is going to be my first webinar in about a month. Uh, my wife and I welcomed a new little bundle of joy into the world. And uh, since then, I've basically been on diaper duty. Um, it's been the longest stretch that I've had without uh, actively following markets on a very short-term basis in a very long time. Um, so today is going to be somewhat of a journey that we can share together. I'm uh, getting my legs back underneath me. I'm going to take a look at what's happened over the past month, um, trying to coalesce what's happened already in 2019 with what might be around those next few corners. Uh, so in the effort of simplicity, I was going to try to stick to the U.S. dollar today for the bulk of my presentation. But of course, this is all about you. So setups you have or pairs you want to take a look at or markets you might have questions around, don't hesitate to fire those my way. I will do my absolute best to answer as many of those as I can. And uh, would just like to say thank you so much to everybody for all those congrats. This was, uh, wow, that's all, that's all that I have for it. It, uh, you know, I knew it was going to be awesome. I knew it was going to be a great thing, but I'm just still taken aback by how utterly amazing it has been. Um, without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and knock out the risk disclaimer. There we go. Uh, we only have one this time. I'm going to leave it up for about 15 seconds and then we'll get right onto the charts. And Michael Millane, again, I thank you that for very much for that, sir. Uh, <laughs> Gerald Smithers, Smither, I'm sorry. Uh, congratulations on your new bundle of joy. Or no, Gerald said, suspected that was it. Yeah, I try to <laughs> that's practice. I try to not just go away, you know, without at least kind of preluding where I'm going. But uh, our little man wanted to come out a couple weeks early, so who was I to uh, who was I to resist? All right, here we go. Let's make this happen. All right, so probably one of the more surprising things to me over the past few weeks is the the lack of direction that has been showing in FX markets, even despite the uh, continuation of the risk rally that's largely held throughout U.S. equity so far in 2019. Uh, give me one second. Also came into the office to a new recording setup, so I have a few different things to to work on. In, uh, in process here. Uh, nonetheless, um, taking a step back, looking at the daily, like I was saying, the lack of directionality that we've seen across FX markets has been somewhat of a surprise to me because uh, equity asset classes, especially in the US, have been ripping higher for a large portion of the month. We've seen a uh, kind of a reemergence of that, that risk on trade that had become so commonplace up until Q4 of last year. In FX though, we've largely been working with some ranges. Um, the last webinar I did was right here, January 8th. We had this quick little check down towards 95, but since then the dollar has basically been in a range. Pop back up to that 96.47 Fibonacci level, came back down, caught a higher low above 95, and now we've reverted right back into that 96.04 Fibonacci level. Let me show you where these fibs are coming from so that you have some reference to work with. The 96.04 level, that's the 50% marker of this major move, taking the January 2017 top and drawing that down to the February 2018 low. 50% market right there at 96.04. And if we zoom in, you can see where this level has gotten quite a bit of play over the past couple of months. We first tested above in uh, mid Q3 right in here. But as we came into Q4, caught a bit of resistance, resistance, support, support, even some short-term support just a week and a half ago. And now we're back up at resistance. The quandary that I have is, again, like I said, a lack of directionality. Look at this weekly chart. Prices have uh, very valid support, very valid resistance. So at this stage, about the best or more attractive theme that I think would be here around DXY or the U.S. dollar isolated uh, would be to wait for that to break or to look for quick short-term trades off support and resistance levels. Um, the shorter term variant is not a strategy that I would be as excited about right now. I would be 
more driven towards waiting for a break, particularly if this 96.47 level could get taken out. As you can see here on the weekly chart, that was the lower high that had come in before this higher low had printed. So if we can get some continuation of this near-term theme that has been pretty clean, look at this on the four-hour chart, bottomed out last Wednesday. Since then, it's been a pretty strong, consistent run higher. Looking on the hourly shows that as well. But if that can continue beyond that 96.47 level, I do think the door could soon reopen to bullish strategies in USD. Uh, until then, I think it's more of a prospect of picking the right spots or trying to pick the right spots. Um, there's a couple markets that I think might be geared up for that continuation of USD strength type of theme. Um, and we'll go over those here as we, uh, as we look at each of the major currency pairs. Uh, Euro dollar. I think this is somewhat of the culprit for that lack of directionality in the U.S. dollar because, and and this was something that we had mentioned uh, that I had mentioned before uh, before I went away on paternity leave, which was bulls have had every excuse in the world to punch this higher. I mean, we've had this build of higher lows that had worked for a couple of months coming into the new year. We had an increasing frequency of tests at resistance, and that could be seen since about the week before Christmas. Go down to a four-hour chart, and you can see where prices have been uh, uh, redriven back into that zone, almost as if that has like a magnetic polarity to it. Um, but just like the dollar, take a look at the longer-term setup, and it's basically just back and forth mean reversion type of price action. Prices have been chugging between support, between resistance for the bulk of this period. And until that breaks, until that impasse shows a willingness to give, I'm going to have a hard time picking a direction here. Uh, shorter term, I do think there could be interest around, and let me go down to a two hour, there we go, around the possibility of a new downtrend. Um, and I'm taking that from the fact that prices have just come down to set a new swing low, breaking below last week's, uh, last Wednesday's swing low. It's a quick test below. And you look at the hourly and it does appear as though there's been some consistency in this selling. So similar to the US dollar with that short-term pattern of strength, there, there may be an open theme to work with here for short-term traders. In essence, looking for a continuation of the momentum that's built off these lower lows and lower highs. Um, I think that this area could be a bit of a trap between 1448, 115 flat, because notice how we have had two lower highs that have printed below that. If prices jump back into that zone, well, we would have some higher highs on the short term chart. And I would be hesitant towards towards trying to sell it off at that point unless I see a very respectable build of resistance. Um, so again, similar to the US dollar, just in the mirror image direction, um, there could be an open door for short side momentum strategies inside of that longer term churn. For longer term strategies, the more attractive theme appears to be one of patience, waiting for it to break, waiting for it to give way um, before longer term directional strategies might be favored or attractive again. If I had to guess which side to look on, I would still be looking at top side. And uh, that would merely be driven from the fact that the U.S. dollars had a lot of reasons to rally over the past month, and, and it simply didn't. Um, we were working within that churn, within that range, and uh, I would be biased to the downside on the matter, which would be biased to the upside here on Euro. Even with the abysmal data that's come out of the Eurozone, I think this is going to be one more of a uh, rate divergence kick, whereas we've seen the Fed scaling down rate expectations it's a theme that could have some more pop behind it, whereas uh, rate expectations were never that bullish around the euro. And if they could merely kind of hang in the median, uh, the simple fact of rate expectation around the dollar driving lower, I think, could provide a bit of support to the bid here. But until that breaks, caution is the name of the game. All right. One thing that was pretty interesting over the past month, that top side pop in the British pound. That thing put in a very strong rally. Uh, so it started off the year in a very rocky way. Prices initially had crushed down below this 125 figure, set a low at 124.37. But since then, I mean, or rather from then into that last week of January, it was largely a one-way show. Prices rallied all the way up to 32.18, caught a bit of resistance. And then you could see the way that that theme had shifted, at least up until this morning when when it kind of hit fever pitch and prices just drove below that 130 psychological level. 
But initially, this looks like it was a technical move that's gotten a bit of help out of the data, right? The technical move being that we had a very moderate, decent-ish pullback to work with here with prices uh, given a 23.6% retracement. Of course, until that morning splash came in, prices drove below that 130 level. Now, in this morning's market talk, I had uh, drawn attention to this Fibonacci level at 29.20. That right now is what's helping to set the low today. The low actually came in a few pips above that level, but this is uh, appears to be the area with which is helping to substantiate support. Similar theme, right? Longer term, it could be difficult to prognosticate on direction given the fact that price action has been somewhat sloppy of late. The shorter term we get, I think the more possible some momentum-based themes could become. Uh, like for instance, on this two hour chart, a pullback to finding resistance at prior support, you know, it could be off of a level like 130, maybe even 30, 34, which is the 23.6 of that Fibonacci retracement, somewhere around there. That could open the door for short side momentum strategies. Um, scaling back to the four hour chart, this, could actually support bullish strategies for those that are looking to fade or, or uh, counter this morning's move. Uh, in essence, using this morning's low, using that Fibonacci level as a point for support, point for stop placement, and then look for prices to come back to that test of 130. Uh, risk reward could be a little bit challenging there. If it's a 130 test, there's 45 pips of possible run, which would mean uh, stops would probably be most attractive at 30 pips or less. Um, it, we're at 29.55 right now. That level is at 29.20. So if I'm looking at like 29.15, it's really kind of stretching that risk reward ratio to a slightly less attractive spot. Um, it, it, 45 pips of upside, 40 pips of risk. I don't know if that's something that would be as exciting as uh, the you know like a one-two or something a bit more attractive. But again, support held thus far could open the door for bullish reversal strategies on a slightly longer term scale than what might be attractive for those short term momentum strategies. All right, dollar CAD. All right, so just right up front, I don't know what to do on this one. Um, it's similar to cable, I do think that there are scenarios or setups on both sides, and depending on how one wants to massage the portfolio. Um, the, 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 the bullish side of the argument would, in essence, be looking to play a fade after that 2019 downtrend ran into support above this Fibonacci level. And similar to cable, that could open the door for a stop below that swing low, below the Fibonacci level, um, at least in the effort of concentrating risk. This would be about 75 pips, but again, we're on a daily chart versus the two-hour and four-hour charts I was looking at on cable. Um, but something like that could be attractive is if meshed up with an initial target up to say like 32 and a third or 3250. Um, 3250 could offer about 110 pips of possible upside, uh, making it just slightly under a one and a one and a half risk reward ratio using a stop below that 3065 level. That's the long side of the argument. The short side of the argument would, in essence, be using that same Fibonacci level that we had used. I think it was back in yeah, it was back in November. It was right off this point of confluence. Um, but as you can see, go down to this four-hour chart where there has been a tendency for some resistance to show around that level. Now we're testing above it right now. So what we need to be seeing is prices would need to peel back below that level by the time this four-hour candle closes, thereby giving me an exposed topside wick right up here. That could open the door for a relatively tight stop, just looking above that 3170-ish area. Uh, with something like that, it could make for possible targets off that 3066, 3065 Fibonacci level that had previously helped provide some support just uh, last Friday. Uh, Canadian employment data, I believe it's Canadian employment data, is out on uh, is, is out this Friday. Let me just double check and confirm that is in fact the case. Yep, yep. Canadian employment data, Friday morning, 8.30. Uh, this is one of those rare prints where Canadian data comes out or Canadian employment data is coming out on its own, uh, not being released with non-farm payrolls. So it might get a little bit more attention. But again, setups on both sides. Uh, traders would likely want to pick the poison that fits best with the overall approach of their portfolio or just stand back, wait for this to clear up and, and let it build into a 
more attractive longer term trending type of backdrop or position. Dollar yen also been some interesting moves in this one so far this year. I mean, it started off just tearing lower. Um, you know, and we'd even talked about this as it had happened or shortly after it happened. Uh, many were calling it a flash crash. I had a difficult time with that term in dollar yen, uh, given that it was a surge of yen strength. So yen wasn't exactly crashing, it was surging. Um, but that move played out over a two-day period. Since then, it's been largely give back recovery and prices angling right back into this resistance zone that I looked at before I went away on paternity leave. Uh, now, that zone is, it starts around the 50% marker of a Fibonacci retracement that has a series of levels that have shown some validity over the past few months. Uh, the Fibonacci retracement that I'm speaking of starts off here in November 6, 2017, and draws down to the low that was established on 26 March 2018. Since then, there's been a number of support and resistance hits that have come in within these levels. Um, the 23.6, you could see where that had helped to establish the support after that quote unquote flash crash or that surge attack on the Japanese yen. See where this, uh, these candlestick bodies are cut off directly at that FIB level? Pretty good evidence of support coming in around that area, around 106.99. Um, after that came into play, the 38.2 marker came into play. Resistance and short term support short-term resistance, short-term support, and then we came back for short-term support just last week, last Thursday. Uh, the 50% marker of that major move, 109.67, and I've drawn that up to 110 to look at this as a zone. Um, that zone has now given us four different tests, three of which, I don't know if I'd want to call that a failure as much as just a lack of success. This one was a failure as prices pushed down to that 38.2 marker. But I'm trying to look at this, or I am looking at this as a type of ascending triangle formation, right? Because there's a strong area of horizontal resistance that's continued to hold the highs. Again, fourth approach, right? And even after this fourth approach, prices aren't pulling back. They're, they're hanging there. So bulls are still pushing. It's just bears have their line in the sand that they're defending around that 110 marker. Um, but this is one I would want to keep a bullish bias on. Looking for bullish themes to continue as prices break up and retest that 110.86 level. It's the 618 retracement of that major move. Now, if I'm not able to catch that, I'll simply wait for that level to come into play, and then I'll look to play a pullback to support prior resistance. Uh, nothing too complicated here. Just trying to keep it super, super simple. But uh, recovery does appear to be in full swing at this point in dollar yen, given the persistence of bulls and their inability to let prices pull back and break that series of higher highs and higher lows that's developed. All right, taking a look into Oceania, Australia. Um, yeah, similar story here is what we have in dollar yen. Year started in a very nasty manner. Uh, now this one did actually show tendencies of a flash crash because this appeared to be a short Aussie type of scenario where the bottom of the bid just fell out, Aussie dollar, Aussie yen. And this thing put in a strong break below 70 and a run all the way down below 67.50 in the first couple of days of the year. And this comes after bears were just tiptoeing around that 70 big figure until we finally opened the door in 2019. But similar to dollar yen, since then has largely been a tone of recovery. Um, higher high, higher low, higher high, hold it in that resistance zone. Now that resistance zone is a key one at 7185 to 7206. Uh, for those that are regulars are probably tired of hearing me drone on about this level, uh, even with the month absence. Um, but this is essentially comprised uh, the zone is comprised between two longer term Fibonacci levels. Uh, these levels have had a lot of relevance of recent as well. Uh, you can see where we'd started to test this to support mid August, caught a bit of short term resistance here early September, even came back as short term support here late September. Uh, the bigger push for this theme for me was in early November. Started looking at top side setups, prices broke up above that zone, and then it soon became support, and then became resistance, and then resistance again. And now it's back at support. Now, I had written about this one yesterday in Market Talk. And in essence, looking at the fact that this pullback that is shown in the pair, pushing prices back down to support, was happening in front of an RBA rate decision uh, that was due out for later that night, last night. So two-hour chart, we could see where that quick topside pop came in. Prices found resistance on a trend line projection as taken from the January and February swing highs. 
And so it's still at a rather tenuous spot. There is an area where this could be preempted, however, and that would in essence be looking for short-term support to emanate from that prior swing of short-term resistance. You can see right there. Now on an hourly chart, there's been like three consecutive hours of grind at that level. So there could be a short-term momentum theme of interest to work with here. Um, on a longer-term basis, again, not trying to overthink things, we look for price to break this chain of lower highs. This developed over the past few trading days. If it takes out that 72.65 level, the door could soon reopen to higher highs and higher lows. That's brought on right there. Pretty interesting backdrop that we have in Aussie right now. All right, and the last major pair, Kiwi Dollar. Similar story, albeit uh, maybe a bit less emphatic. Big support zone. It's come back into play in the pair after uh, a, a really strong theme of recovery had held throughout most of January. First couple of days were very rocky. Uh, this thing bottomed out just below that 66 handle. And since then, it's been largely a show for the bulls. Higher high, higher low, higher high. Is this going to be that higher low? Now, the support zone that's in play is the zone that I'd worked with previously. That runs between 68.70 up to 68.77, so quite a bit tighter than that 20 pip zone that I was looking at in Aussie. But you can see here where that pullback did meet its maker at that line of support. Go down on the hourly, it becomes a bit more evident. There we go. And that second, and the second stab bulls just weren't going to take a deeper test and have thus far held that higher low support. So this is something that I think could keep the short side of the US dollar as an attractive theme. Um, you know, again, just looking for stops below support. And if the trader feels they could factor that up to a respectable target with a risk reward ratio of greater than one to one, then I think this is something that could stay as attractive for short term themes. On the target side of this, it really feels like it'd be squeezing to look too far beyond 69.30 um, because we've in essence had two tests above that level over the past, say, year, uh, each of which have faltered, right? And you see this extended wick that happened just after we'd come off this fresh, uh, fresh yearly high, I believe. Let me just confirm that is in fact the case. No, not quite. Might be a fresh month and a half high. Uh, nonetheless, I digress. Um, you can see where this extended wick came in after that quick test. So there's some sellers to be found around 69, 30 and above. Um, so if there is a drawback on the short term setup there, that would be it in my opinion. It's trying to factor this with stops below that big support zone to the point where I would have to in essence, try to moderate the stance, maybe look for an even tighter stop below these two swings that have come in around 68.80, just to squeeze the risk a little bit more to make a target at 69.30 or just below a bit more attractive. Okay, well, there is one more dollar pair, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it. Uh, Swissy. Swissy, back to parity. And a pretty interesting backdrop around here. Um, and you can see where there have been some variated trends that have been in force, like December, for instance, brought back the downtrend that ran into the first week and a half of January, at which point support around the 97.50 level held, prices broke back up, and now we're pushing up to a fresh, this would be a month and a half high, two and a half month high, excuse me. So this is similar to dollar CAD in the fact that I do think there could be setups on both sides of this. I don't want to chase either of them. Um, but again, my case likely isn't that of, of everybody else's in the room. So that's why I said I'd be remiss if I didn't look at it. The complication that I see with topside setups is we just re-encountered that parity level, and that parity level hasn't really been to accommodate for bulls of late. You can see where it's helped to top out that resistance in late November, early December, before bears were able to take control. Uh, so I, I think it could be daunting looking to get long when we're up at that level that has had a tendency to reverse uh, advances in the very recent past. On the flip side, the move higher here has been very concerted, very strong, very consistent. I don't know that I would want to call BS or try to fade that move, just given how strong that move has been thus far. So it seems to me that there's warts on either the long or the short approach on this market right now. Um, 
But for those that are super aggressive, it could be looked at as setups on either side. All right, let's just close off some equities. S&P 500. All right, like I said, it was largely a one-way show since that early January fright um, continued the Q4 the Q4 sell-off. That early January fright came in here uh, after prices had tested a fairly interesting zone of resistance, a confluent zone of resistance around 2,500 on the S&P. But we pulled back, bulls took control, and they've largely been running the show ever since. And you can see fairly conservative top side run, fresh near-term high right there. So the big question is the buy the dip strategy back where traders can essentially just look for prices to pull back, find support, stop underneath, look for the bullish trend to continue. I'd be very cautious of that because what showed up in Q4 is not something that I think should be summarily discounted. No, I'm not going to forecast a, you know, a big short type of backdrop here, the same as I wasn't going to as we were coming into the year after that sell-off had developed. But the increasing amount of volatility that's been seen in equity assets through last year, coming into this year, even with this top side rip, that's not usually something that happens in a healthy market. When we get those corrections, that's often the way that they'll begin, increasing volatility on either side of the equation until eventually we get up to an area where bulls just have no more muster to buy anymore. Now, again, I'm not going to be so bold as to call this an, a harbinger of doom or that, uh, that just because volatility is increased, prices have to go down. But this does denote that something has changed from those same consistent bullish trends that we were looking at in Q3, Q2 of last year. So I am looking at this as being a different type of backdrop. Now, what could make the S&P 500 attractive to me again is a pullback to this level. This is the 23.6% retracement. Is this at 26.74? Uh, this is a level that had previously given some resistance on the way up just a couple of weeks ago and again last week. There you go. Right in there. And as yet, has not yet been tested as support. It feels like there could be a bull trap up here around 27. See, there was a decent build of support. I think a retest there could be of a challenge. If we get a retest there, I would look for this to drop a bit deeper. See if I might be able to get it a little bit cheaper down around that 2674, 2675 area. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Similar story. I mean, that 786 Fib retrace under the December sell-off uh, was also resistant here in the Dow as we'd opened up into this week. Topside push around yesterday's open or shortly after yesterday's opens, led into fresh near-term highs. Kind of the same story. I don't want to chase it under the illusion that we are trading in a theme similar to last year because what happened in Q4, it happened. It's not arguable. Um, and I don't want to uh, summarily discount that just yet. What could make this attractive again for topside setups, a uh, very short-term level might be possible here around 25, 125. This would be a bit tricky because I'd probably want, only want to react to this around a U.S. equity market open. I'd probably be hesitant even on like say Dow futures, for instance, when U.S. markets were closed. Um, a bit more interesting would be that longer-term level that I pointed to a moment ago, that 23.6 Fib retracement that had given two different doses of resistance January 18th, a week later, January 25th. Since then, haven't been tested. Uh, we haven't tested that resistance, that prior resistance is fresh support. Now, this is a bit more challenging, but I would still even be open uh, to the bullish theme on a retest here, the 618 Fib retrace from 24374. Um, I would be a bit pickier depending on the way that support comes in, because as you can see, there are a series of higher lows with which to work. Taking that low up to that higher low to that slightly higher low, depending on how deep prices penetrate below that, that Fibonacci level and below those series of lows, that's going to determine how attractive the setup is, at least in my opinion. If we don't see bull defense on that most recent higher low right there, it's not going to be nearly as attractive or it's going to be much more attractive than if we penetrate below that and start to test this higher low. What I would like to see here is is a very respectable build of support to show me the bulls aren't going to accept much of an offer before 24374. 
at which point they pounce on the bid and look to drive that thing back up. Till then, caution is the name of the game. A uh, bit of confluence right up here. That's 25,600 or right around 25,600. 14.4% uh, Fibonacci retracement of the December sell-off. That meshes up with the 14.4% Fibonacci retracement of the post-election move. Right in there. It's 25,595. I think those are meshed up pretty close together within like a few points. All right, half past the hour. And that, my friends, is what I have for today. Um, fire questions at me. I have about 15 minutes for q and I'm going to answer as many as I possibly can. And hopefully on Thursday, I have my sea legs under me a, a bit more and I'll be able to get a bit deeper with some of these pairs that have put in a lot more volatility, like some of these yen pairs, euro yen, pound yen, et cetera. <laughs> Uli says, uh, S&P, Dow, and gold, please. Enjoy the next 20 years of responsibility. <laughs> it's funny. That's the that's probably the biggest surprise to me because going into it, I, like I said, I had very high expectations, but, you know, I was a little bit, I'll admit it, afraid of things like, you know, changing diapers and stuff. But once you see that it's your baby, it doesn't matter. All that melts away. So 20 years of responsibility, bring it on. I'll take 40. I don't care. Uh, gold, that's the one market I did not look at. Um, <laughs> and if you see my chart, you probably got a good reason as to why. It's pretty messy here. Um, there is a decent-ish, uh, I say decent, it's a very subjective word. There is a, a, a notable level that's come back into play, that 76.4% Fibonacci retracement. Uh, you can see where this had previously given a decent dose of support, decent dose of resistance. And that's not the first time we saw that uh, similar theme develop back in August as well. Um, you know, on the way up here, 1300 just felt like a very tough nut to crack. It, it eventually did with that January run. Um, but given the consistency of the move that we've seen in the U.S. dollar, I think that's what's given gold bulls a bit of a pause. There we go. So I, I think on this one, Uli, it just really depends on, on how aggressive someone wants to approach the matter. I think for those traders that do want to be ultra aggressive, I think there could be a backdrop for bullish strategies right now, given that we have a pullback to a Fibonacci level. Uh, I'm on a daily chart, look down on like an hourly chart. There you go. You see we've had a, a, some higher lows that have built off of that, even saw a very recent test of fresh higher highs right in there, breaking above that prior point of resistance. Um, so I, I think there could be, you know, a, a, a workable case there for bullish momentum on a short term basis for those that are OK with being ultra aggressive. Taking a step back, if that support doesn't hold, that is going to take a bit of the, the shine off of that bullish trend that it developed in that last week of January. But 1296 up to about that 1301, I mean, that could be another possible area of support. Um, I, I think the real challenge here would be bearer strategies unless more of this fills in because, I mean, this has been a concerted topside run that's held more or less in varying form since the open of Q4. And uh, I'd be hard pressed to prognosticate that coming to an end until I have evidence to suggest as such. Uh, from Quran, very good question here. Any mileage in the view that if the DAX is roaring up, um, if the DAX is roaring up, more likely euro dollar to go down. Uh, there's a lot of folks that trade overlay or that'll trade correlations or they'll heavily follow correlations or they'll use currencies to try to, uh, to try to predict equities or equities to predict currencies. I try to look at them in a somewhat, in, in somewhat of a disconnected manner, or at least individually, It'd probably be a better way of putting it. And, and the reason for that is because everything's, everything's a trade whether it's the DAX, whether it's the Euro. You know, so the challenge, in my opinion, of trading overlay is making sure that the, that the strategy is set such that there's um, a plan for a possible outcome given the range of possibilities, right? And, and what I mean by that is correlations don't always hold. So there's a possibility that Euro goes up, DAX goes down because of you know, disconnected drivers or 
you know, maybe the ECB throws some water on this whole idea of an additional round of QE. And then, boom, we have a stronger euro. I don't know if that's something that necessarily would immediately impact the DAX. Um, it may, but I guess what I'm saying is that in the effort of simplicity, I try to look at these markets individually. And, you know, unless the relationship is very pronounced, I'm going to be hesitant to um, to use that as the centerpiece of my strategy or, or my trade idea for whatever market that was or is. Uh, from Pete, uh, looking at Euro, using November low, it looks to be wedging up. That might be the case. Um, I might be a bit biased on the matter because the swing that I was following or the trend line that I was following caught a bit of violation. And uh, and so I scaled, that, I scaled that idea back a little bit. Let me show you what I was talking about. I was previously looking at this trend line. Right in here, and I could make the argument that there was some symmetry between this swing low and that one, given that trend line projection. And then, you know, even when it came down here January 22nd, I had to respect the whole of that trend line. But this thing lurched below, and once that happened, it, you know, it uh, to me just said, hey, we just got more mess to deal with. So maybe there's something to work with there. There might be. I would want to see a third touch of that trend line to know that uh, that there was something there. Um, you know, but but when that trend line broke or when those lows were taken out with that January 24, January 25 run, that's what made it a bit less uh, a bit less attractive to me for the uh, for the idea of an ascending wedge type of formation. Uh, from Gra Ros Guerrero, Aussie Swiss. Ooh, I like where you're looking. I like where you're looking. Take a theme of recent strength, take a theme of recent weakness, and mesh them together. See what you get. All right, I thought I had one of these already annotated, but it does not look like that is the case. If I could avoid using those flash trash wicks or those, uh, let's call them outlier moves, I'm going to. So let's look at the uh, post SNB range, taken from this Fibonacci retracement. Some elements of symmetry in here. There we go, pretty decent little trend line. I call it decent because uh, these two connecting points meshed up really well with this third test. So this was a this is a trend line that I would have uh, a little more confidence behind given that we did get that, that additional touch and I'm considering that as one touch even though they they both align fairly well all right so given the fundamental themes here you know ie um, that Swiss weakness that is uh, push dollar Swiss back up to parity. That Aussie strength that's pushed Aussie dollar back over 72 uh, that that support zone 71 85 72 06 I'd want to have a long or topside bias here, given that fundamental push, or given those themes that are shown in the representative major pairs. It's a bit too rich to make stops below that Fibonacci level really attractive. I think a deeper pullback that could tighten up that stop a bit could be it could make it a little bit more attractive, right? Because I know where that recent point of resistance, re recent point of support was. For bullish continuation, I would want to see higher low support. I'd want to see respect of that support level that, that had come into play uh, just yesterday. I just don't know if there would be the upside potential to be able to justify that unless prices pull back a bit deeper, a little bit more. Yeah, I think the next area of interest for top side targets would be around the 73 handle. In essence, look for a retest of the bearish trend line. Let's come back into play. And um, I'd be hard pressed to want to look for targets beyond that trend line. Just given the fact that, it, again, it's, it's had some, some very decent reactions of recent. All right, a lot of good questions here. I have to hustle up and uh, try to make the best use of my time, best use of our time. 
uh, from Pete. Um, I think it on the greenback uh, view through DXY is that even with an extreme turnabout of uh, Chair Powell's rhetoric and indeed a fairly more dovish Fed and uh, total to start the 2019 year, uh, the U.S. dollar has been very resilient. Buyers are indeed continuing to bid the currency higher, 96.30, a gap for the 96.52, followed by a year-to-date high, 96.68. Are the levels I'm watching, but the price action to start February seems to have uh, shaken off a volatile January. The risk component comes into play, and as markets shake off a new trade atmosphere, with many coming off the sidelines to test the waters, uh, it's time to be careful. But these are definitely developed for some bigger moves soon, like the possibilities in yen and commodity pairs, as well as the majors that you have so completely covered here. Thank you for that, sir. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, it it that kind of goes in with what I was saying around some of these equity markets from. Uh, from Q4 of last year, I mean, I think it's 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 really easy to just take what was was popular a year ago or two years ago with the buy the dip strategy, right? And just look to reinforce that 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 template and look for that strategy, that theme to come back. But you know what happened in December? It happened, you know, and and whether it was Fed driven, trade war driven, uh, what have you, until there's you know, a, a greater sign that bears have been left in the dust. I, I think at the very least, we've got to acknowledge the fact that there's a possibility for a version of that negative price action. Um, where this relates in currencies, it, to me, at least feels like there's been a lot of reasons, a lot of excuses for bears to take control here in USD. They just haven't had any assistance from many other spots in the world. Like, in DXY, for instance, like 57.6% of this is the euro. And, you know, it's like I said a little earlier, there's, you know, a very valid technical case, in my opinion, for a stronger euro. It's just that there has not been that follow through on the fundamental side of the equation that's allowed for that to continue. Um, so, yeah, this is not this is not the time to be greedy, in my opinion. This is the time to be fearful, even though there have been, you know, the build of some decent trends, some decent momentum, uh, and some very key risk markets. Yeah, it's uh, also from Pete, I'm not a feel the markets guy, but something doesn't quite feel right here with equities, extremely skeptical. I think I'm gonna be extremely skeptical for the uh, duration of my markets career. <laughs> I think that's a good thing. <laughs> Caution is the name of the game. Um, Yeah, in Chris AB, or maybe it's Chris Ab. Um, uh, FYI, the DAX has many export titles, so a strong euro usually has a negative impact on the DAX. Right, but what I'm saying is if is if I want to look for a weaker euro, I'm going to sell the euro. I'm not going to sell the DAX. And if I expect a weaker euro, then why would I want to sell the DAX? or even buy the DAX or do anything around that. I'm going to focus on the target market individually and look at them as being unrelated because the shorter term we get, the more chaotic those correlations can become because they are separate differentiated markets. But no, Chris's point stands. That is the fact uh, because there is a lot of export exposure. If we see a strong Euro, that's generally going to mean a more competitive business environment within Germany. It's going to be challenging for German corporates, which is then going to equate to more pressure in the DAX or DAX-based themes. Um, last year was a really good example of the way that that correlation can play out. But it's also an example of how there are other things at play. So I'm just going to add in uh, Euro dollar. And they're both on the same side, so this meshes up fairly well. But you will see deviation between these moves. Uh, not always where they're doing you know, totally different things, but strong top side run in the euro. Match with a general feeling of weakness in the DAX, but there are portions in here where the DAX is going down uh, while the euro is going down. Right, that, those correlations aren't always going to stay lockstep, so thereby if trading overlay, you got to make sure that there's something else on the other side of the trade so that if that relationship doesn't hold, you have something to offset that. That's what I was uh, referring to a little bit earlier.
uh, from uh, Michael Siveram. Hello, Michael. Uh, big fan of your work, James. Great work. I don't always get to watch live because I'm usually working out in Asia. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, how far do you see the S&P 500 moving up and how far down eventually? Oof, tough, tough questions. So, you know, like I said a little earlier, I am skeptical of looking for, you know, a, a, a full on reapplication of the, 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 the BTD, the buy the dip template. Um, the move higher has been a little too far, a little too fast for my comfort level, uh, especially if looking at instituting short term momentum strategies. That's the area right in there that to me is kind of picky. It's around 27 and three quarters up to about 28.15. You can see there was like a decent build of resistance there in, in the opening or the earlier days of Q4. But I mean, I can even draw that back to that Q1 spill that we had because, uh, you know, if putting the entire thing in scope, 2018 started in a really strong manner. S&P goes up to a fresh all time high and then the music stops all of a sudden. And then for the duration of Q Q1, there was a lot of worry out there. That started to give way in Q2 as the buy the dip strategy came back. But that volatility has just continued to expand. So maybe a retest within that area. But if we do take out that high at 29.42, then proverbially all bets are off. That's where I would look for prices to run up towards the 3K psych, uh, the 3,000 psychological level. Beyond that, it would just be pure guesswork, throwing darts at a board. Um, on the downside, I think that's one that I could be a little bit more prepared for given the history of price action around these, these uh, deeper levels. I think a, a 2,000 print wouldn't be outside of the realm of possibility, but more adequately, I'd be looking 2,200 up to about 2,250 to see what happened there. Um, I think that would be a, a big about face for the risk trade. And that's the point where I think, you know, the Fed's going to start looking at options or at least talking about looking at options, which could then thereby become a self-fulfilling prophecy of support. Uh, from Pete, if you could, please take a look at Aussie and thinking there's some uh, meat on the bone. Let's take a look. Ooh. Mm. Tough, tough, tough. So it broke below that low, thereby giving a level of invalidation to that Fibonacci retracement, which should make it a bit more hard pressed for me to be following the resistance test of that 23.6 marker. But the fact the resistance has come in off of that level, it's undeniable. It helped to give the swing high on Friday. Seen some reaction there so far today. Let's investigate a little deeper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. All right. Popped above here. Yesterday, support, resistance. Let's come right back. Yeah, I think that, you know, similar to what I was saying on Aussie dollar, where on shorter term basis, there could be uh, tr some attractive top side themes here. Um, hourly chart, you could see where there's been a build of support as indicated by these wicks off of a prior area of resistance. That could keep the door open for a quick retest at that Fibonacci level. I don't know if it gets the 80 big figure. Matters can get a little bit tricky when approaching a big figure, but that momentum side backdrop could be there. See what you're saying, Pete. Good eyes, my friend, good eyes. That's not the one. I mean, there's a general theme there. I just can't get a good trend line that, that actually catches most of this. You know, there's a bit of penetration on either side no matter how I draw it. So the well, lawyers would probably need to keep this in a horizontal type of manner. Around 79.43. That's the area that appears to be hoping to set the low right now. I mean, with something like this, at the very least, I could tight stop it so that if it doesn't hold, I could get out of that really quick. Um, you know, minimize the loss and then maybe look to play a, a support reversion a bit deeper, something like that. LDHF, my friend. All 
uh, from Chris Ab. Good question. Uh, quick general question. Is there a reason why you don't use moving averages, it seems? Uh, I do. I do. Um, just in a different way. I, I kind of keep those compartmentalized. Um, the moving averages that I use are right in here. It's my, I call it my finger trap strategy. And so what I'll often do is, is I'll use the analysis that I go over here in these webinars to try to find themes with, with, with which I can then trade inside of. So the way that I use these moving averages is fairly simple. I'll look for the juxtaposition of the 8 and the 34 period EMA on this hourly chart. If that directional bent agrees with what I was looking for on the longer term analysis, like say for instance, I was looking at Aussie dollar a little earlier, share that I uh, might be attracted to the top side of that market. Uh, so for the actual triggering of trades, what I can do is I can go down here, I can wait for my strategy to actually fill in with a long or a top side setup, and then I can simply use it to react there. Um, what I want to see for longer top side setups, I want to see the eight above the 34 here on the hourly chart, which it just barely is at the moment, but is. And then I go down to the five minute chart, and then I'm in essence looking for a momentum side tops uh, a momentum side bullish break above the eight period EMA. We don't have that momentum right now. Five minute chart, it's largely back and forth. I need to start seeing this. I need to see this start going into higher highs and higher lows. At which point I could then look to basically try to play pullback, right? With something like what we have here. Let's see when did that flip into a bullish manner. Something like what we had right there, like that hourly chart. That's when I'll go down to the shorter term, trying to pick this off or trying to look for ways to buy low, sell high, quote unquote. And uh, what I'll use to denote high and low in that, at that point is that eight period EMA. Test below shows me there's a potential area of support. Then I'll have to play in that direction. So it's kind of like trying to, you know, if you're looking down binoculars, for instance, right? If you look through the side, you're not going to see anything because you're looking through the initial scope into the side of the binoculars. you got to line it up so that you're looking from the front end to the back end. Once then, you could magnify the view or get a greater look at, at what it is that you want to see. Um, so to use that analogy, in essence, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to line this up or these longer term themes like higher highs, higher lows in the Aussie with a decent support reaction could then be coalesced with a short-term strategy going in that same direction, right? And, and very similar to what I was looking at on the longer-term chart. We have that pullback to support a prior resistance. The trends are not really showing as prominently right now, but if it does start to get moving, then I'll be able to see it fairly quickly here on this hourly and five-minute chart, at which point I could then look or try to work with triggering into the move. So yeah, I use moving averages. I just put them in their box. I put them in their, uh, put them in their compartment, and I, I keep them there. Pull them out at the most appropriate times, or try to. Yeah, good point here from Chris. Absolutely, there's no reason to trade DAX and focus on currency such as zero. Yeah, and my apologies if my initial comment there was, um, um, if it sounded like it didn't directly address um, what either Karan or Chris was saying. Um, the reason I bring that up is because many times when I'm when I'm talking with folks that are, you know, learning about correlations or learning about overlay, you know, they'll they'll look at it from a perspective of oh, dollars up, well then the S P 500 has to be down. No, I mean, you know, maybe if we look at it over a year long basis, that relationship might have some element of correlation. But, you know, here on these short term charts, those stops they get hit really quick, and those correlations don't always hold on these on, on uh, you know, especially around news releases, things like that. But yeah, point absolutely taken, Chris, for sure. Uh, from Kron, with finger trap, presumably you're working out target levels by looking at next R on buys and next S on sells. Yes, by and large, yeah. But for you know, if I'm down on a five minute chart. The targets that I'm looking at on a four-hour chart could be a bit disconnected, and if that was the only target that I would allow myself to use, then um, then the potential risk reward would look more attractive. But I think the feasibility of actually attaining that would be a lot lower. So what I do with scalping into entries is I will have the same targets if those get met that I'm looking at on swing or longer-term charts, but I'm also a lot more open to scaling up quicker, more aggressively. Um, you know, and that is going to be situation dependent to a degree. Like, for instance, right now, if it's the British pound, anything around the British pound, I'm scaling out of that as quickly as I can. I don't want to hold any any bags of risk on that. 
Whereas in the Aussie, I might be a bit more open to holding on to that last scaled position. You know, whether it's a quarter of a lot, a fifth of a lot, or a tenth of a lot, I might be a bit more open to holding on to that in the effort of trying to build a position that could emanate from uh, the continuation of a longer term theme or, 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 uh, or scenario. So for instance, if we do see continued recovery in the Aussie, then that's something where a position building kind of approach could be attractive on a longer term basis. Whereas you know, we look at cable, what's going on around Brexit right now is utterly unpredictable. And I think it could be really, really difficult to try to prognosticate a longer term, um, longer term trend here, just because there's so many unknowns around this. So doing anything here, I'd want to be a lot more aggressive on those scales, meaning I would want to I'd want to start factoring initial scales off my stop distance. So for instance, if I have my stop above that swing high 2960, price currently 2950, so it's 10 pip distance, which would be tight even for me. But nonetheless, I'd be able to look at initial targets around 10 to 15 pips away. So at least there, I'm still factoring a one-to-one -one or a one-to-one point five or greater. And then if we do get that deeper, bigger picture breakdown, then fantastic. But if we don't, then it stops to break even after that first scale and I get taken out of my initial entry or around the initial entry. All right, I got to take the last couple questions of the day. Uh, from Pete, so you streamline your finger trap to two EMAs. Red and blue used to be the crossover, and the lime green was the trigger. Um, it, it's the same strategy. Uh, it, it's just now that I'm looking at it, or because I'm looking at it on two different charts as opposed to one, I don't have those four. When uh, I was presenting this in the past, when we were doing a lot of trading education stuff, on the five-minute chart, I had the ability to use multiple time frame moving averages. So I could have an 8 and 34 on the hourly also an eight and a 34 on the five minute. So I wouldn't need to toggle back and forth between the hourly to check the juxtaposition of the EMAs down to the five minutes to look at entry. Um, but with TradingView, I don't believe there, I mean, I know there's some custom indicators, but the ones that I've looked at didn't have exactly what I needed. So I, I just haven't used them and uh, just reverted back to the old school toggling method. Hourly for direction, five minute for entry. Okay, so the last question of the day. Um, do you have a price action strategy to entering your trades? Yes, I do. Um, it's not, you know, holy grail or anything like that. Um, so there is an expanse between analysis and trading. And I try to talk about that a lot because I think for a lot of traders that are building their approach, still improving on strategy or, or, or looking to just looking to increase um, looking to increase their overall approach or improve their overall approach. I think that this is something that is pretty important. Um, decision making. What is the difference between analysis and trading? It's in essence just that decision making. Analysis is, is not. I'm not going to say that it's easy. It's not. But it's not as, as brutally honest as trading where you know right off the bat that you're wrong. With analysis, it's actually beneficial to be a little bit stubborn to a degree, not to be shaken out by you know a quick support or resistance break. Whereas in trading, I don't have that comfort because if my stop gets violated, I can't just pull it. If I pull it, I know what's probably going to happen. It's probably going to continue to run against me. So I got to hold those stops and limits. As a trader, I have no choice. Even though as an analyst, I might want to, um, you know, stay in a setup or stay in a market that I have a lot of confidence around. As a trader, it doesn't matter. Um, but the difference, the the delineation between the two classes, between an analyst and a trader, is decision making. And and this is something that could be challenging right up front. It's how to make the best possible decision with given information. And I don't think there is a great way. I don't think there is, you know, a way that's universally going to work for everybody. So what I had developed was, I call it the four-hour trader. It's really very simple, where at the end of each of these four-hour candle closes, I look at charts for like 10 minutes. I scroll through the majors, and then I look for prices um, to find support, 
for long positions, resistance for short positions, really just very that simple. Stop below or stop above, and then I look at it four hours later at the next four-hour candle close. So in essence, I think one of the easier ways of approaching the matter is to limit your decision-making potential or possibilities where, you know, if I'm looking at four out of six four-hour candle closes in a day, 10 minutes each takes about 40 minutes. So for me in New York, that's one, five, and nine. It's so like 1 p.m., stop what I'm doing, look at charts for 10 minutes, see if I could find a wick testing a support level that I could get a stop below and look to play a swing in the other direction. Um, but I think something like that could simplify matters a little bit because if you're watching, if you're watching candles paint all day, then you know it becomes a little bit more of that paralysis by analysis thing, and uh, you can overanalyze the situation all day long. It's not going to help you necessarily make decisions um, any more efficiently. So that's one approach uh, that I found that's, that's that's worked for me. But like I was saying a little bit earlier, the um, the way that I go about it now, trying to look at markets through a binocular where I'm lining up that longer term view with a shorter term view that I'm more comfortable with. That's what works best for me because I'm kind of a control freak. Um, you know, I don't like having 150, 200 pips stops if I don't have to. I'd much rather tighten up the stop and take 10 different swings with 25 pips each versus, you know, one big one at 250. Yeah, sure. Maybe I'm right one out of 10 times, but I don't care. I'm not in this game to feel good. I'm in this game to try to win. Um, all right. So I have one last question from Pete and then we'll end it. Uh, if time permits, would you uh, write a little something regarding the risk off trade that seems to have gone on, uh, gone to the back burner? Obviously a lot has changed since you went on a baby leave. Uh, yeah, I could definitely get something like that in the queue. Um, it might take me a couple days to write it just because I'm still kind of, like I said, getting my sea legs underneath me. But uh but yeah, that's something I could totally touch on. For the end of this week, I believe I'm going to be writing the technical forecast for equities going into next week. And that seems like it could be a, a perfect venue for that topic. And I, I think if I can fit it in there, that's what might work best. But with that said, I just want to thank everybody very much. Thank everybody so very much for your time today. All the well wishes, uh, all the questions, comments. It's been awesome. Uh, love being back, uh, even though my little boy's at home and I can't wait to get home to see him. But thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. And as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.